This episode is brought to you by StoryWorth. Visit storyworth.com slash gems to get $20 off when you subscribe. That's storyworth.com slash gems. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 224. I'm recording in December 2018. And of course, being at the end of the year, it's got me looking back at everything that's gone on in the genealogy community here at Genealogy Gems, and just in general in life. And so I thought today we could try to catch up with each other a little bit and can share with you some of the things that I've been doing and just It's been too crazy and too hectic to have a chance to talk to you about it. Also talk about the impact of some of the episodes of the past year. I think that uh, I've been hearing a lot from you and looking forward to sharing that. And I think intermixed in all of this will be some new ideas, some reinforced ideas, maybe some things that you heard along the way this last year and didn't take action, but this will be a great little tweaking reminder. I think the big story for me in 2018 was travel. And it's funny how every year seems to have some kind of a theme or some kind of a story to it. And certainly it has been. It's just the way that the year turned out. And I didn't really plan it that way, but that's definitely the way it it occurred. And really it culminated after just a lot more travel on a monthly basis throughout the year, starting with, you know, going to Roots Tech in Salt Lake City, heading out to Australia to keynote their event and many places since then. In the fall, it kind of all came together with this almost like an eight week tour. It was crazy. And again, not by design, really. It's just how things kind of fell together. So back in um, early, well, you know, October is Family History Month right? So that's obviously a very popular month for seminars and conferences and that type of thing. And, and typically seminars is the situation. So early in October, I kicked it off and went to Laguna Beach, California. What a lovely place to kick off (laughs) some traveling in the fall. Uh, Laguna and the whole area uh, out there, uh, Elisa Viejo, and those little areas are just glorious. And the library system out there is fantastic. And so I spoke at the library out there in the Laguna Beach area, and it was lovely. And get this. Now, this was a really unusual thing for me. I normally have somebody traveling with me, but it's either my husband or it's one of my daughters, and they work with me and they do their job on the road. This time, my best friend from junior high came with me. (laughs) Cindy was a fantastic travel partner. And Wow, I I don't know why I didn't do this sooner. But of course, Laguna Beach was a nice enticement, I think, for her to come with me. She and I have been friends, best friends, really, since seventh grade. I was her maid of honor and her wedding. We've just known each other forever. The kids have grown up together. Of course, we live thousands of miles apart now. She's up in Washington State, and I'm down here in the Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas area. So we don't get to see each other as often as we'd like. But Laguna Beach was the perfect connection point. (laughs) So she flew down from the Seattle area. And I came in from Dallas. And we had a couple of extra days just enjoying ourselves. And I really needed that because the eight week stint that started with that weekend was just nonstop. It was awesome. We did so many amazing things. And it was grueling at the same time. And I know you can imagine if you're doing that much travel. It's hard when you don't get a break from it. You know, I'm amazed I had clean laundry throughout because I don't know how, but pretty much I flew in, did my thing, went home, did laundry, did dishes, repacked, and my dogs just looked at me like, seriously, you're doing this again? I thought they were going to just crawl in the suitcase and say, fine, I'm going with you. They didn't. Um, The next weekend, I went up to Seattle, Washington, and Bill went with me on that trip. And spoke at the Puget Sound Genealogical Society, which was technically in Bremerton, Washington, where the shipyards are and Silverdale, that area. It's a lovely area. Most people just kind of know Seattle. So I mentioned Seattle. Of course, the beauty of that trip was that we took an extra day and all our families up there, certainly Bill's families up there. 
So we got together in this lovely restaurant, Anthony's, right on the water, right out at Point Defiance Park. And it's just this panoramic view with the the ferries coming in and out and the glorious weather up there in October. And we had all the siblings, all the cousins. It was a great, great chance to get together. Last time we got together was when his mom passed. And that was her favorite restaurant. So it was a treat to get together again and on a happier occasion. Now, after that, went straight out to St. George, Utah. So I keynoted at the Family Roots Expo that they had out there. A really great event. It was my first time there. And I got a chance to debut a brand new presentation. I'm hoping I'll have a chance to share it with you at Genealogy Gems in some format. I don't know if I'll do a video or what we'll do. But it was it was neat because I got a chance to kind of talk from a philosophical standpoint. I don't know how I feel about genealogy. What does it mean to us? Why do we do this crazy thing? How can we do it in a way that's even more meaningful? And so that was just a really big treat. And I got to meet lots of wonderful, enthusiastic genealogists out there. Because I was going to be doing genealogy roots again, The next weekend in October, we ended up uh, heading to Sandy, Utah, and we got an Airbnb. And that was the first time we'd done that. And that worked awesome. I have a feeling there'll be many more Airbnbs in my future (laughs) as I'm traveling because it can be so close to the venue or wherever it is you're going when you're traveling. But we had the entire basement of somebody's home. It was a complete self-contained apartment and it was massive. (laughs) I mean, it was just so big. Hannah flew out from Texas to help us out at Genealogy Roots. So she came out midweek. She had her own bedroom. We had a room. We had a kitchen. It was really a cool deal. And again, less expensive than a hotel. So I don't know if you've ever done a B Airbnb, but that's the way to go. And the way they have it kind of set up, it, it it's really kind of foolproof in terms of security and that kind of thing and what you're getting into. And you get lots of information up front and there's lots of accountability. So I don't know. I thought it was fantastic. So I had a chance to kind of hunker down in our bunker, in our basement bunker in Sandy, and do our last minute preparations for the Genealogy Roots Conference. So that was a big two-day event. It was held inside of the Senior Expo in Sandy, uh, which is a massive event on its own. And we had, for our initial opening, 300 genealogists. It was fantastic turnout. And it was two days. Diane Southerd and Sonny Morton came out and joined me on the stage for that. And we just had an awesome time hanging out, not only kind of doing a real production on the stage, but having one-on-one time with people in between breaks. And it was just, it was personal in many ways. And I really liked that. And we heard from lots of people who attended that they liked it too. So that was tremendous. It was a big undertaking, but I'm hopeful that we'll get a chance to do that again in the future. The next weekend, Des Moines, Iowa, total change of venue, (laughs) but a wonderful society. And they held it in a uh, museum there downtown and had a wonderful time there. Great hosts. The next weekend, We went out to, let's see, Hannah went with me to Des Moines. And then the next weekend, I turned around and Bill and I drove up to St. Louis, Missouri. And so we spoke to the St. Louis Genealogical Society, terrific group, really well organized. And they are going to be the people behind the big National Genealogical Society Conference in 2019. It's going to be in St. Charles, Missouri, which is a really cool old town, kind of the, the heart of the heartland and a real gateway for a lot of the migration that was happening across the country years and years ago. So NGS conference is going to be in very good hands. I'm really looking forward to that. And I'll be doing many uh, presentations at NGS this year in 2019. And then from there, let's say the next weekend, it was up to Minneapolis, Minnesota. So here's the thing. And I haven't really told you guys about this, but I have been struggling for two years kind of with chronic pain. And I know, big departure in conversation. But basically, what happened was I have a dislocated tailbone. I think it was an injury from falling down too many times. I don't know. But it really flared up and it became a problem. And and sitting is really painful. And so I was going to drive up there and we were going to take this, you know, extra days and do all kinds of genealogy research when we're up there. And it just, it wasn't going to happen. I had already been on 
15 hour flights to Sydney, and I was going to be on a 15 hour flight to Oslo, Norway, uh, just after that weekend. So we ended up flying to just try to keep it short and sweet. And it's a long story. You don't want to hear about it. But you know, we all have our, our burdens to bear. And, and this one has just been really challenging. But I just want to put a little tiny personal note out there. Because maybe one of you who's listening, who's a rabbit genealogist, maybe you're struggling with something like this. One, if you've had any kind of tailbone pain, there is help. What's interesting is, is that I found it from a couple different sources. You can go the whole injection route. I have made the trips out to Rutgers University and I've had treatments out there. And, and then there's the whole mental part of it. In fact, I would say if you have dealt with any kind of chronic pain, what I've come to discover is that there is a mental component to the, the nerve pathways that happen and the chronic pain that goes the way it travels through your body, the way it sticks with you, even if the actual injury is resolved. And that's kind of what's been my case. And I have been finding through a book called Unlearn Your Pain by Dr. Howard Schubner. That's how you say his name, Schubner. I have to recommend it to you because if chronic pain is in your life or in your family's life, and I'm guessing almost everybody listening knows somebody who has dealt with an injury or dealt with ongoing pain, this book has changed my life and changed my ability to travel and to do things and just my overall happiness. It's called Unlearn Your Pain. Check it out if that is something that you're dealing with, because I didn't really believe up front when I started reading it that it could be possible that my brain is just hanging on to pain pathways should long since have been gone um, after the tailbone injury. And I thought, okay, well, what have I got to lose? I just kept following the book, kept doing the, the meditations and the work in the book. And I'd say I probably have reduced what has really truly been debilitating chronic pain by probably 85 to 90%. It's huge. Is it totally gone? No, but I don't think I'm done yet. (laughs) So if that rings a bell with you, I just wanted to mention that because life's been busy. I have not even bothered you people with it, but it occurs to me as we close up this year that this has been a real factor in my year and having to kind of brave the pain in order to go out and do the things I needed to do. And I'm sure that there's somebody I'm hoping Well, I'm not hoping that anybody out there listening is having pain, but I'm pretty positive that some of you are and take a look at it. You know what? It never hurts. Uh, I don't get anything from, from sales of the book, but it's improved things for me. So if it improves things for even one other person listening, then that's the beauty and power of having your own podcast. You can talk about those things and we're friends. So I could talk to you about that. So anyway, that story wraps back around to going to Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's why I flew and did it as a two hour flight versus making the drive and getting to do the genealogy research that I really wanted to do up there. But here's the way things work. When you kind of honor yourself and take care of what doing things the way that best meets your needs right now, other opportunities open up. And we got up there, we arrived, I don't know, probably got out of the airport about three o'clock. You know, it's getting to be winter time. And it was November and so, or late October, and we only had a couple of hours daylight left, maybe three hours. And so I looked at Bill and I said, are you by chance up for driving out to Winthrop, Minnesota? Now, if you've listened to the show for a long time, or you've been in one of my classes, you know that uh, Winthrop, Minnesota is where the Larson family is from. And that's where a tremendous amount of my research occurs. It's actually Bill's family. It's his mother's family. She was um, from the Larsons in Minnesota. She was born in Winthrop. And over all these years and all this research that I've done, we've never been. And it turned out that it really was only about an hour, hour, 20 minutes outside of Minneapolis, out in farmland country. And he's like, sure. (laughs) So we just changed the navigation from the hotel and we started heading out towards Winthrop, Minnesota. So then, of course, you know, my brain is thinking, I've got this non-genealogist husband driving me to Winthrop. I better have something to show for this. You know, I mean, I better have something that's going to be interesting to him. And I did not have any opportunity to plan this trip. And of course, I would usually wholeheartedly encourage you to 
plan ahead, right? So you get the most out of your genealogy research trips. So what I do, I put my phone on personal hotspot. So I had some Wi Fi in the car, and I pulled out my laptop, and I started doing some quick googling, really just googling to figure out what's out there. Could we figure out where the Larson hardware store actually physically was what the building was? Could we go visit that? That would be great. My first initial googling on Winthrop and history brought up a page for the Winthrop Historical Society. And I'm thinking to myself, they don't have a historical society. I've researched this place for years. I've never seen this come up. Well, I hadn't actually in probably 12 months, you know, run that search. And in that time, they created an historical society in Winthrop. It's just a small town. And so I'm looking at this page and and they say, well, we have this little small museum and you can come visit like there's a four hour window on Tuesdays, right? You've seen that when you've gone and done your research trips. And of course, I've missed that. But there's a list of ladies who have organized this group and with their phone numbers. So I grabbed my phone. We're still in the car. We're, you know, halfway there. And I called up the first gal on the phone. And I explained, well, you know, I'm on my way. I'd love to come. She says, Oh, I could open the doors for you. And I could let you look around and come into the museum. And when are you going to be here? And I said, Well, in about 40 minutes. (laughs) She's like, Oh, she goes, you know, I would actually do it. Except in 30 minutes, I'm heading out to go to this event where I'm being honored for my work as the founder of this historical society. I'm the person of the year here in Winthrop. And I went, Oh, my gosh, that's amazing. Okay. So I just asked her a couple of quick questions. I mentioned the Larson family and LJ Larson. He had a lumber and a hardware store it was in town. Did she know where that was? She knew who the Larsons were. You know, there definitely were four founders in that town. And so she's explained to me where some of the houses were, exactly where the lumber store would be, where we could find it when we get there. And then she says, but you really need to talk to Eric. I'm like, Eric? Who's Eric? Well, Eric Larson. She says, I think that his father was like an attorney or something in town. I said, oh, I I know that. Uh, I know there was a Sheldon Larson in the family who was an attorney who lived in Winthrop. He was one of the last Larsons in Winthrop because my mother-in-law knew him years and years and years ago. She says, yeah, well, his son lives in town. He'll be able to tell you things. And she says, oh, I don't have his phone number. And then she says, just Google it. (laughs) Okay, I could do that. I could do that. So I got off the phone and I start Googling Eric Larson. It took actually a couple of different sites to work it around to figure out which Eric Larson. Yeah, there were just a couple in Minneapolis and Minnesota. I narrowed it down to Winthrop, finally got a phone number, called it, you know, and I made that call. And the funny thing is, is before I called the, the gal from the Historical Society, I really hesitated. And you know what went through my head? Lisa, what would you tell people who are listening to your podcast? (laughs) I would tell you, what are you waiting for? Pick up the phone. That is truly what made me call her in the first place, which then led to calling Eric Larson, which led to an invitation to come by his home. We did and we spent three hours at his home. And it was absolutely wonderful. He he was a little bit like, who are these people? But then, you know, I clearly knew enough about the family and could explain that, that he realized I was legit. I knew who I was talking about. And so as we sat there for three hours in his lovely living room with many of the family antiques around us, he kept saying, oh, I think I have something. Let me go see. And he'd pull out another box. He'd pull out another envelope. I ended up with family charts back into the 1600s in Sweden. I ended up with photographs of my husband's great, great grandfather and uh, a photograph of them together. It's just priceless, you know, holding the shared ancestor in a photograph, the two of them standing in front of the mantle. It was just such a wonderful little piece of genealogical serendipity. I hope and I know that these things happen to you too. But what a joy it was and what a payoff it was to realize, you know, so many times the big payoff is all hinging on us. It's all hinging on our bravery, (laughs) on our willingness to be the person who actually takes action, who actually picks up the phone. And over and over again, you know, what we see is luck or genealogical serendipity is really just a blessing that you are willing to be brave 
and to take action and try it and call. And if all he said was, I think you sound crazy, I'm not going to have you come to my house. Okay, you know, it's no skin off my nose. So it but of course, it didn't turn out that way. It turned out wonderfully. And I've been sharing, in fact, I'm going to share something as soon as I get done with this podcast episode over on Instagram, because just some of the stories, some of the pictures and things and us getting our photographs outside of the Larson hardware, it was really a thrill. And a thrill for me, because of doing all the research on the family, even though it's not my family, you know how that is. You do research for friends or other family members, and you realize you start to feel like this is kind of like your adopted family. I certainly feel that way about the Larsons. And I felt such such a presence, I think, from Bill's mom. I really did. That she was there with us, that she was thrilled, that we were that we cared. That was probably the overwhelming feeling I had. It wasn't, oh, good, you found him. It was just the sense of, that's so sweet of you guys, you know, <laughs> that, you, that you're here and you're enjoying my family and that this mattered to you. And it really did. But I just had that feeling that she just really felt pleased. You probably felt that too sometime in your own research. So that was Winthrop and what a terrific group, the Swedish Genealogical Society in Minneapolis. We had a blast. They were so enthusiastic and just super accommodating. And and what a wonderful group. I'd, I'd love to go back there again sometime. I customized my all my presentations to be focused on Swedish examples and research. And that's really fun for me is when I can take those core topics that are research skills that anybody could use. And then I love customizing it for the groups I'm talking to because everybody's got a little different, a little different slant. And then they want to see how that works in their neck of the woods. Then at the end, I get to stand there on the stage and say, okay, well, it got to go because next weekend I'm going to Sweden. (laughs) They all went, oh, we want to go. And that's what we did. The next weekend I packed up. It was like a three day turnaround. Now that I think about it, it was a Wednesday. Lacey and I jumped on a plane and flew to Oslo, Norway. And I'll tell you more about that right after this. Okay, so I want to talk to you about your data for a minute. Whether you're new to genealogy or you've been at it for years, your genealogy software database is the backbone of your research. This is where you store the data that you're finding, and just as importantly, the sources where you found that data. Your database is the master file that you retain control of, and you can easily pass it on to future generations. So when I get asked about which software I use myself, the answer is Roots Magic. With Roots Magic Web Hints, I can see the record hints that are available on all the Genealogy Giants websites, Family Search, Find My Past, My Heritage, and Ancestry. And I love the variety of reporting tools that makes analyzing my data and setting up my research plans easy. And I know synchronization to your online tree is important to a lot of you. Roots Magic is the one that can synchronize with all the Genealogy Giants. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. You can get started at rootsmagic.com. Okay, so as I was telling you, three days after I got home, Lacey and I packed up and jumped on a plane to Oslo, Norway. And this was to speak at the first ever European conference and really first ever it wasn't the first ever European conference. I don't know that that's the case, but it was from my heritage. And, and one in recent memory that I can think of, my heritage put together its first user conference and they held it in Oslo, Norway, kind of a middle meeting point for all points around the world. And they really had people from all over the world. It was tremendous. And I heard from many of them how pleased they were that somebody had actually brought a conference to them. That doesn't happen all the time. We know that Roots Tech is going to London in 2019. It's still not really in you know the heart of Europe. And I think that there was a real appreciation for being in Oslo. And what a terrific place. Some of the things that we did there, because I know I think I mentioned to you that we, we did this conference in a previous podcast. I think I mentioned it. Some of the things that really stood out to me on this trip was, one, just being part of kind of a groundbreaking event like that and the tremendous response that we got, particularly those of us from the US, from the Europeans. It was really, really wonderful. My favorite thing was going to the Viking Museum in Oslo. It's 
really tremendous. And one of the organizers of the upcoming The Genealogy Show, which is going to be held in Birmingham, England. And I'm, I'm rifling through my cards to find, I don't have the dates in front of me, but one of the organizers was also attending the Oslo My Heritage Conference. Now, her name was Liv Burgett Christensen. And I know she'll forgive me if I didn't say it in the right accent or pronunciation. I'm trying. Leave, like Leave Oldman, right? She organized a group and she said, I'd love to take you on a little tour, and show you some parts of our city. She's very proud of it and knows the history of it, which was wonderful. And we kind of blossomed actually into a group that included Diane Southerd and Daniel Horowitz. And we went to this Viking Museum. Now, what made it really stand out were a couple of things. One is the idea that history was literally buried under the ground. These ships, they had three, I think there were three full-blown ships, Viking ships. So we're talking, you know, a thousand years old, reassembled inside of this beautiful building. And these were discovered in various parts of Norway and Sweden. And the Vikings would take a ship of a king or somebody very important in their community and bury the entire ship. And these things are huge underground, much like a, like a pyramid or a tomb, you know, and they would build a little thing on the back and put the, the important people there. They would even sacrifice, you know, their animals that belong to them and other goods. And of course, their jewels and, and whatever objects and possessions that they had that they were important for the afterlife, this would all get buried. And they are discovering these kinds of ships. You've probably heard of recent discoveries. Well, these things are just awe-inspiring when you see them in person. When you really think about how far they've come, what it must have taken to reassemble them, and the continued work, and what a fascinating continuing work that they're doing. And of course, Lacey was mesmerized by the whole thing. You know, she uh, has a degree in forensic anthropology. And so this was just fascinating to her. And so the Viking Museum, when you go in, one one of the most amazing things about it is this video that they show up on this tiled ceiling. And it's really done in music and in visuals, trying to kind of convey the history and what was important to the Viking people. And I thought something else that was interesting was as we made, we had a tour guide who showed us around the museum. And I finally just piped up and I said, okay, I'm just going to ask the question. What's a Viking? Now think about it. Is a Viking a race? Is it a country? Is it a people? Is it just a description? And she's like, you know what? People almost never ask that because I think they're afraid to. But it's an awesome question because it may not be what you think it is. Viking is really a description of a people who lived at a certain time in a certain area who had a certain culture, right? So it's not like you can say, well, I'm this much... French, and I'm this much Italian, and I'm this much Viking. Because that's not, it's not really apples and apples. Um, So I just thought that that was fascinating. And in fact, over on Ancestry's blog, Anna Swain, who's an expert in DNA, she wrote an article, it was called, Are You Part Viking? And it's a question that they get all the time. And she kind of goes into the history of Vikings. And that really, what you're looking for is that Scandinavian piece of your ethnicity pie. Um, So I'll have a link in the show notes. I won't go into reading it all to you here. But it's just it's a fun look at it. And it kind of opens your eyes to what it means. And actually how it's not something that you can concretely say, yes, this is absolutely Viking. I suppose if you really did a lot of research, you could but the Viking people led fascinating life. They said that something like 10% of them were actually out there pillaging and doing those things. There was such a a community. And in fact, when Lacey and I went from Oslo, we moved over to Gothenburg, Sweden, for just a couple of days for vacation. And we went to the museum there, and they had a wonderful Viking floor. So there was a whole display and exhibit on Vikings there. And in that museum exhibit, uh, it went into not only the ships, but also the culture and the people and their beliefs. Uh, Even something very interesting, like the fact that unusual with many cultures at that time, women could own property as in the Viking culture. So it was 
absolutely fascinating. I, of course, bought books so that I could go home and read more and educate myself. I'm sure there are some of you out there who know many more things about Vikings. But uh, it's really fun to kind of look into a whole nother area of history that certainly I wasn't very familiar with and, and to see it having literally been raised up out of the ground. Pretty amazing. And I think the, the last thing I wanted to share with you about that trip was in Sweden, how interesting it was to me that, uh, you know, Lacey works full time with me here at Genealogy Gems. She certainly has embraced the genealogy world and community. Um, she doesn't really do her own research necessarily, although I can give her a task and say, well, can, you, can you go find this? And she's great at that. But I could see it in her eye and I could hear it, <laughs> what she was saying in her voice as we were walking out of that museum. And, you know, she could pull off being a Swede. She's blonde hair and tall and has the pale, you know, beautiful skin. And she kind of said, you know, I just feel like I'm like among my people. And I'm like, really? And she's like, well, yeah, it's just, it's interesting how sometimes people come up to me and they'll start talking to me in Swedish and I'll say, oh, I'm not Swedish. And they'll go, and they immediately change to English. They know English, but they just assume that she was. And she's just like, I just feel a connection here. I feel like I belong. I feel like um, I'm comfortable with the architecture and the walking here and there and just the things that we're seeing, I feel a connection to. And I can't really put my my finger on it. I'm like, yep, I get it. <laughs> we all get it, don't we? There's those times where you just go to a place or you come in contact with a new document or something and you just go, oh, there's a connection there and I can feel it. What, can we feel it in our DNA? Maybe so. But it warms a mother's heart to hear such a thing <laughs> from her daughter. And we had the world's best Swedish meatballs. That's all I can say. If you ever get to Gothenburg, Sweden, Smacka restaurant, uh, Smacka is known throughout the country for their Swedish meatballs. And they are not the way we make them here in the US. They are so much better. That's all I'm going to say. All right. That's been my life. That's been my world. The pain of it, the joy of it, the constant travel of it, the discoveries, which have just been unexpected and absolutely welcomed. And now I want to uh, shift gears a little bit, head over to the mailbox, see what you've been up to. And I want to revisit a little bit last month's episode, episode 223. Heard from many of you, have some new ideas for you, and that's all coming up next. The folks at StoryWorth accomplished a staggering feat. They got my dad to tell me his stories. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the show that this episode is brought to you by StoryWorth. And as you know, I only work with sponsors I genuinely believe in. Well, I've never known much about my dad's life. He, he's a man of few words, and that especially applies to stories about his life. So I got him a StoryWorth subscription. And every week, they've emailed him a question about his life. And I got to see which questions were coming up. So I could have some input about which ones were to be asked and even write some of my own. As he replies to the emails, I've been receiving copies. He could also have recorded his answers by calling the StoryWorth telephone number if he didn't want to type it up on the computer. And his answers were short. That's just the way he communicates. But I have learned more about him in the past year than I probably have over my entire lifetime. As someone who cares about privacy and security, I really appreciate knowing it's only for us. StoryWorth always keeps us in control of who actually sees his stories. Now, a year later, we're ordering the keepsake hardcover book that comes with the subscription, and it compiles his answers into one volume, and we can upload pictures easily by email, on the web, or through their app. This is going to be a keepsake that gets passed on to my daughters and my grandchildren for sure. So give the gift of story. StoryWorth gives your loved ones a reason to spend time with their favorite memories and share them with you, giving you opportunities to become closer, even when you live far apart. It's an easy and really thoughtful gift, even at the last minute. Get $20 off by visiting storyworth.com slash gems when you subscribe. Again, that's $20 off and you've got a gift that keeps on giving. Visit storyworth.com slash gems. From my hometown. 
first up here in the mailbox, I want to share with you a voicemail I got. Now, this is from a high school teacher named Lindsay, and she called in to share an unexpected occurrence of her own genealogical serendipity. Hi, Lisa. Earlier this year, I was listening to your podcast on my way to school, as I often do. I teach high school English and history, and I think it was episode 214. But you were talking about a poetry contest that you had done a while back and shared a poem and and a moto video that had come from someone from that contest. It was the Where I'm From poem by George Ella Lyon. I was in the middle of a poetry unit, and my lesson plan for that day was to teach that exact poem and have my students write one of their own. What's more is they were also about to start preparing for their final poetry poem folio, which was going to include possible versions of their poetry In video form, I was able to pull up the episode and share George Ella Lyon reading her poem, one of your listeners reading his version, and the video that came from it. I absolutely love your podcast and find a lot of useful tips for my genealogy research, but who would have thought that I would come across something that I could use and share with my high school English students? I'm now inspired to write my own Where I'm From poem as an introduction to a genealogy scrapbook that I'm making. Thank you so much for the information and the inspiration that you provide. Isn't that tremendous? Now that warms a podcaster's heart. (laughs) The idea that we were there right at the right moment in the right time. And this podcast could somehow reach out and teach a room full of high schoolers. Oh, it doesn't get better than that. Let's see here. Now, talking about last month's episode, that was Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 223. Dr. David Haas was my guest. We talked about old home movies and how each of us is really a bit player in other people's home movies. And that means there are movie clips to be found. There are ancestors and family members to be found in other people's online video. And that one of the things that we can do is strive to get our films digitized so that we can share and really touch the lives of other families who we may have some of their family history in our own home movies. I have certainly been looking through my own home movies. One, I'm a little shocked that I have as much as I do. So I have my grandmother's old home movies. A little bit of my parents took a few more with the same camera. Uh, Those were all on 8mm. But I also have many more VHS tapes of my family um, from the very beginning that I didn't realize we had taken so many. And it's funny, now that I've mentioned it to the kids, they've said, oh, I remember as kids, we used to sit there and watch home movies of ourselves. And now that I think about it, they really enjoyed. I mean, what kid doesn't want to watch themselves on TV? So my kids did a lot of that. So I've been pulling these together, reviewing them and getting them ready to digitize. Several of you asked me for more information about digitization. We're going to talk more about that right after this. Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage. They have over 70 million members worldwide. Now, if you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. I uploaded my family tree hoping for a breakthrough in my German family line, and that breakthrough happened really quickly. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany, and that was my first international cousin contact. And MyHeritage has a unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. Now, this constantly calls over 8 billion historical records for your family. It's also the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. So find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait, and there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit myheritage.com. Okay, so let's dig in a little deeper into how to get your films digitized. And we're not just talking about films as an eight millimeter or super eight, but we're also talking about VHS tapes. Uh, In fact, as I was going through my own home movies and pulling them out of all the different cabinets and drawers, I realized I have mini DVs, I have high eight DVs, I've got VHS, I've got 8mm, I even found a spool of audio tape. I have no idea what it is, but it was in the box with my grandmother's 8mm films. But let's talk about how we can get the movies digitized. 
The company that David used that he mentioned was Video Conversion Experts. Now they're in Chandler, Arizona, but what really kind of sets them apart is the quality and the equipment that they have. They're not just digitizing, they're really restoring. And if you look at the films that David had digitized from his home movie collection, you can see how vibrant they are, how sharp they are, they're stabilized. They're just tremendous. And that's not by accident. That was the work of video conversion experts. Um, I reached out to them myself because I've got some of my videos here and I have these eight millimeter home movies that I'm concerned about. So I'm going to send this reel out to uh, video conversion experts and have them take a look. I've been talking to Brad out there. He's been so helpful. Their website is so helpful. You can do a lot of the legwork. And I think this is what put me off from doing this in the past, why I've hung on to these for so long. You go to a website and it's really not crystal clear why it's any better than anything else. And then the pricing is not very clear. <laughs> Their website is really step-by-step -step walking it through and you know exactly how much you're paying and you know exactly what kind of work you're getting done and what your options are. And that is really key. I, I'm really actually excited. And of course, he's just been so helpful that I can't wait to get these out to them and, and see the results in the restoration. So that's Video Conversion Experts in Chandler, Arizona. Of course, we'll have a link in our show notes for them for this episode as well. The other company that I really like is Larson Digital. Now, they're out of Utah. And we I actually had Kristen Harding on here a couple of years ago. It's one of those things where I think I got really busy traveling at that time, just like this year. And I never ended up getting my films turned in, I don't think. But I've talked with her and heard about their process. They too are a family owned company who really knows their stuff. So you can ship to either one of them. And as David talked about in the episode, he talked about, you know, between FedEx and really securely shipping everything and, and wrapping everything, you can really be confident. And I would recommend I'm breaking mine up into a couple of different shipments. In a sense, if, if, God forbid something terrible happened to one package, you wouldn't lose everything. So some of the things I'm doing is I am playing them on my TV and I'm filming them with my phone before I stick them in the box. I mean, at least that way I just have them. If some hurricane hit and something happened to the package, I'm also not putting all my eggs in one basket. So they're not all going in one box. I might put it into two to three shipments because I have enough tapes to kind of warrant that. I'm sending my high eight video cassettes. I've got 10 of them here. Um, these are going to be going out to Larson Digital because they can get these copied and put into a digital format for me. And see, the thing is, is the camera that created these videos does no longer works. And I'm guessing you might have a situation like that where the camera that you used originally, it, it no longer functions, you can't play them back. Um, I certainly don't want to buy another camera just to be able to play them back. So getting them digitized is the perfect solution. And, you know, it's interesting, as I've been reviewing my VHS tapes, that little VHS player acts like it's coughing and sputtering and on its last legs. I did some looking. You can't just walk into a Best Buy anymore and buy a VCR to play them back. So there again, as the technology is changing and the hardware is changing, this is the perfect time, folks, if you're dealing with the same situation I am with the equipment, to go ahead and get them digitized. And that way you can view them and you can edit them. You could turn them into other projects. I'm nervous about setting them off, but Kristen Harding over at Larson Digital has been tremendous uh, to work with, to coach me through the process and get these things packaged up and shipped off. When you're doing something that feels just kind of out there and you're letting it out of your control, it's really nice to know you're working with family-owned businesses, that there are real people who talk to you on the phone, and that the website is really clear and upfront about what your choices are and then what the cost is going to be. So Kristen's putting together a special coupon code for us. So we'll have that in the show notes as well so that you guys can get a bit of a discount there. Kristen has graciously put together a 15% off discount code for all of you listening. Uh, when you go to larsendigital.com, uh, it's L-A-R-S-E-N digital.com. 
And when you check out, you just enter the coupon code Gen Gem, as in genealogy gems. So G E N like Nancy, G E M like Mary, no space in there. You put in Gen Gem and you will get 15% off over at LarsonDigital.com. And again, it's L A R S E N. Video conversion experts actually has a big sale running in December. So I don't even need a special code for you. Just go there. Hey, if you let them know that you heard about it here, that's just lovely because it's goodwill for all of us, but they have a wonderful sale. So keep an eye on their website. And if you're hearing this in December of 2018, this would be a great time to jump on it. And it sounds like this might be a big holiday sale. So if this is way into the future, you know, maybe you want to do some planning now so that the next time the, the holidays roll around, you can take advantage of their sales there as well. So I heard from several of you, Greg in New Zealand wrote me and he says, I'm loving the new narrative profile episodes uh, because we started this all right. Remember with 219, when we talked to Julianne Mangin, just kind of that storytelling documentary style of the podcast. And he says, I've noticed that there's an evolving voice and style in episode 223. And he said, David Haas's story reminded me of my good friend, Mark Holtz. An editor in Toronto, Mark has digitized all of his grandfather's 16 millimeter vacation films from across Canada in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They are brilliantly presented. Mark is very talented, and I think they're worth sharing with your listeners. So he sent me a link to a playlist over at YouTube at Mark Holtz's YouTube channel. And he's right. These are really great. If you need some inspiration to get yours digitized, maybe even do some editing and and a little embellishment. This is a wonderful playlist to take a look at. There's one in particular that Greg flagged me on. Now, the description of this particular film, it says, a number of eight millimeter film reels were purchased at a flea market in New York City for $10. So this is not the vacation collection. This is an actual group of these eight millimeter films. Somebody picked them up for $10 at a flea market. It says they ended up being home movies taken in the late 40s and the 50s. How they ended up at a flea market in Manhattan all those years later is one thing, but most importantly was getting the films reconnected with the family 60 years later. And this has a particular little twist in this story in that as you're watching this story of the films, how they were purchased, how they made their way back, you hear the phone call to the family member that he tracked down through research. And it turns out that the inspiration for the movie Awakenings Robert De Niro played a man coming out of a coma, and I think Robin Williams was his doctor. That man is in these movies. That was the brother of the man that he tracked down to restore the movies to the family. It's an amazing story. So take a few minutes out, okay? If you're in the app, you just swipe down because you're going to see all the show notes down there, all the links. If you're on your computer, you can go to genealogygems.com. Click on podcasts in the menu, click on Genealogy Gems podcast, and uh, right up there towards the top, you'll see episode 223. That's the link to get you to all these notes and these goodies. You don't want to miss that video. Now, I heard from Kate, and she said that she has been trying to set up a collection of her memories on YouTube. So she took this idea of searching for family and things that connect to her own memories, memories of people in her family, much like Debbie did in episode 223, which is what led me to David's videos. Kate's been doing this and she's been collecting videos, but she's trying to figure out kind of how to get them organized. She said, do you have any thoughts on how to put these together somewhere? Is it possible to add clips from YouTube videos and not the full video themselves? So I had a couple of ideas. Now, To backtrack, when you go to YouTube and you do a search, you might be searching on a family name or an organization or a business. You usually want to throw in that location. You know, was it Winthrop, Minnesota? Was it some other small town where your ancestors were from? If you're fortunate enough or you find the Macy's Day Parade, like Debbie did, that went with her father's memories, Kate wants to save these. She wants to pull them together in one place. Now, you can save them to YouTube if you have a free Google account. Then when you go to YouTube, you sign in and and you have a YouTube account. You basically have your own channel, your own page. So as you're looking at videos, you can click save this video. 
and it will save it. You can save it to playlists. I would recommend in her case that she would create a playlist. She may have Kate's memories, her dad's memories, her mom's memories. These are all separate playlists. And as she's doing her research and she's finding different videos that tie into these topics that she's researching in her family, she can save them to the appropriate playlist. She mentioned, wouldn't it be nice to have a clip? What if it's a 10 minute video and it's really only, you know, from two minutes to three minutes that really applies to my family? As far as I know, there is not a way to save in that way on YouTube. I do know that when you share a video, let's say you want to click the share button and email it to a friend, the link, you can set it to start at a certain point in the video. So if the important part starts at two minutes and 36 seconds, you can say, that's where I want this video to start when I send it or share it to somebody else. I don't think that really works with the playlist, but I'm going to give you a whole new place to be thinking about doing your organization of these memory videos. And that is Pinterest. Pinterest is very, very popular, usually with crafters and do-it-yourselfers and that kind of thing, kind of an idea inspiration board, kind of a social media website. But here's what it can do. You can organize boards, which are very much like playlists. So if you go to Pinterest, P-I-N-T, E-R-E-S-T dot com and get a free account, you can create boards. And I would say in Kate's case, she could create individual Pinterest boards for each person in her family or whatever the, the division of the memories or the research is. You could do it by surnames. You could do it by individual people. You could do it by time frames, whatever works for you. But then you can save and pin YouTube videos to your Pinterest board. Why is that beneficial? Because when you pin to Pinterest, you can add your own text and description. This isn't possible when you save to YouTube. And in fact, as I was coming up with this idea and thinking about doing this, I'm thinking, why isn't YouTube letting us do this? Make your own notations, have your own little reminders attached to the videos you're saving. So it's more than just a list, but it's, it's really relevant to what it means to you. Well, on Pinterest, you can. So you can give your pin a title. So you can name it the name of the, of the video or something else that helps jog you as to why this was relevant. And then in the description area of the pin, you can write your own memory. This would be a really kind of a neat activity. In fact, it might be kind of interesting around the um, Christmas table or when everybody's huddled around the fire and they're all kicked back and the presents are open. You pull out the computer and, and, you, and you start adding people's memories to different videos or you look for them. It could be really fun. So Pinterest boards targeted to people, memories, whatever way your research is, is structured, and saving videos, pinning them from YouTube. And here's the kicker. When you pin from YouTube, you're using the share button. Remember I just mentioned to you, if we click share a video and we're going to send it over to somewhere else, we could email it, but we could also send it to a social media network like Pinterest. And when you do share, if you scroll down just a little bit underneath the link, you'll see Icons for all the major social media platforms, including Pinterest. It's the big red P, but you can also click the box that says start at. And here I could set a video to start at two minutes and 26 seconds. So when I pin it, not only am I giving it my own title, I'm adding my own memories and description, but I am setting it so that it begins to play at exactly the point I want to play it. I think this will get Kate a lot closer to preserving and organizing the wonderful video memories that she's finding through her searching than if she were to do it at youtube.com. It'd be lovely to see these kinds of features over at YouTube, but right now I think Pinterest is the way to go. Profile America, Thursday, December 13th. The important holiday business of viewing such classics as It's a Wonderful Life and A Christmas Story on home TVs owes much to a technological advance this month 80 years ago. In December 1938, Russian-American engineer Vladimir Zworykin was awarded two patents for cathode ray tubes. One was for the iconoscope to capture video images, 
The other was for the kinescope, which displayed television and computer monitor images for decades until the advent of flat panel screens. Whatever the ills of TV programming, obviously the American people consider it an appliance for a wonderful life. More than 98% of American households own at least one set, a percentage that has held steady for years and across all age groups. Profile America is in its 22nd year as a public service of the U.S. Census Bureau. Thanks for sitting down for this chat here in Genealogy Gems, episode 224. It's just nice to catch up with each other and share with you a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes with me and those of us here at Genealogy Gems. And of course, I love hearing from all of you and uh, hearing what your questions are, what you're doing, what's impacting you. That's, that's a motivation to all of us. And when you share, you absolutely are sharing with other people here who are listening to the show. So thank you so much for doing that. In 2019, I'm not traveling as much <laughs> by choice, which I'm kind of looking forward to, actually. I've got a granddaughter who has taken off and is walking, if not running. And there's lots of things that we want to do together this year and grandsons that are growing like weeds. Oh my gosh, Davy is having his ninth birthday in a week. How did that happen? I know many of you have been listening since the very beginning. Can you believe that? He's going to be taller than me pretty soon. But uh, whatever it is you're doing to wrap up your 2018, I hope it's with people that you love. And I hope it's doing things that are true to yourself and that fill your soul and help bless other people and touch other people's lives. There's so many ways we can do that. And we can do that even in small ways, which is one of the reasons I was so inspired, I think, and motivated to share David Haas's story with you about the videos. Because wouldn't it be you know nice at the end of your life to look back and go, I touched people's lives. I helped people. I restored families in some tiny little way, maybe by sharing just one thing that I shared. And that makes a difference. We all can make such a difference. And you guys make such a difference, certainly in shaping this show. Thank you so much for your huge encouragement of the story format that I've been experimenting with here on Genealogy Gems. We're going to be doing so much more of that. I love telling real people stories. (laughs) Is Is that a way to say it? We all enjoy the shows where they feature the celebrities and their stories. But one thing I hear everywhere I go is, why don't they just do regular folks? I've got amazing stories in my family. I hear you. And I think some of the best ones are people who haven't been on TV or movies, but who know the heart of a genealogist and want to share their story with stories with others. I've got really some wonderful ones lined up for you in 2019. So we have lots to look forward to together, my friends. Thank you so much for your ongoing support and participation in our Genealogy Gems family. We treasure you guys. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.